In this video, I will be addressing your comments, criticisms, compliments, questions. What energy you bring here, I will return to you with the maintenance of rule one, rule equal, the balance of the honor and the grace, and the position of peace and neutrality. Keep in mind, no one is twisting your arm to be here. So keep that in mind. If you are going to make claims or if you are choosing to not read the terms and conditions of the comments field, well, then you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Now, I don't ever take anything personally here. I recommend that you do the same. What I'm saying in this comments video is a critique based upon using the lens of correct sentence structure communication, parse syntax grammar, i.e. quantum grammar, the wonderful technology brought to the public in 1988 by the late Colin David Ivan Colin Miller. Keep that in mind. Everything I say is pretty much through that lens. So with that in mind, let's get to it. First comment comes from longtime viewer and member, Quadruple A. Thank you very much for your membership and for your support. To preface this, folks, I did a poll a few days ago where I asked the community, is it more important to you to be correct or to be humble? Something like that anyways. And the right answer to that is humility in the context of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, psychology. Because if you're humble, then you're open to the fact that you may be wrong about something. And correctness will come to you if you are humble. If you are, if you are cultivating humility, correctness will come. So you're getting the whole package if you choose humility. But there are folks that chose correctness for whatever reason. They'd rather be correct than be humble. Some of them even said, I choose correctness because I feel like it will protect me. I feel like it will protect me. Even if I'm rude to other folks, I feel like, you know, it's kind of a trade-off because I want to protect myself and be correct. And psychologically, that is not the right answer, folks. Because if you're humble... That means you're open to not being correct, meaning you can fix it. You're open to making mistakes because everybody makes mistakes. You're not leaving yourself. It's, it's not a sign of weakness to cultivate humility. It's not at all. If you're confident that things are going to work out and that if you're confident that your volition is on track, being humble isn't going to hurt anything. And even if it does then it's probably a lesson that you need to learn. But if you just walk around, I'm correct, and I want to be right all the time, well, that's just fiction mentality. That's bully mentality, folks. It really is. You don't care if someone gets hurt or anything like that. You just want to be correct rather than being humble. So something else I'll say, an interesting thing about that question that I asked in the poll those few folks, like two or three folks that answered correctly, they answered humility, they have closure on the grammar. They're my best students. They're a high level of correct sentence structure knowledge. They know how to use it. They're very good at it. They understand, they cognize the, the psychology of it. That's why they answered humility. And the folks that answered correctness don't have closure on the grammar at all and that was super interesting that was a super interesting conclusion for me so anyways this is what uh quadruple a is talking about they say i understand from a navigational standpoint i on see red on see red i think they mean answered correctness but not with the volition of harm coming along with it in any way I guess so they're trying to justify why they answered what they answered. Um, and this is what folks do. You know, most folks will do this. If they're wrong about something, they try to explain it away or make excuses or whatever. And folks, that, that, 
that's part of that, you know, authoritarian fiction type training where people just don't want to be wrong. And if they're wrong, they want to explain it away. It's like if, if someone's late for an appointment, what, why are you 15 minutes late? Well, you know, traffic. Well, you know, the kids, this and that. And they make all kinds of excuses. The individual who cultivates humility won't do any of that. They'll just say, I apologize for being late. Um, my bad. And if you chose the incorrect answer in that poll, you chose correctness over humility. That just means you don't have closure under grammar and you got a lot to learn. And it's up to you to t do the necessary steps to learn it if it's important to you. So my kuleana to quadruple A was you chose what you chose. It's okay. It's difficult to shed the fiction mindset of authoritarianism. But it can be done, especially if one takes the time to learn correct grammar and the principles therein, which this fella has been saying they're going to do, but just don't ever follow through. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that either, folks. It's a common story, as I said many, many times in the past. Only a very, very, very few will actually take those steps to do what it takes to get closure on this grammar very very few and one of those few responded and her name is april juanita boyd smith and she is one of my top students uh, she is a very advanced in the grammar uh, she just hasn't used it in a practical everyday life setting yet but in theoretical practice uh, theoretical sense she's very good She's at least 95% there. And she says, I totally agree. Or she says, totally agree. Once I learned the foundation, everything else kind of fell into place. Mistakes happen. Owning them is extremely important. It is very important to admit your mistakes and not make excuses for them. I love being right, but hey, sometimes that's not always the case. If someone wants to correct that with proof, of course, then by all means, that's where respect and not getting butt hurt or also known as not taking things personal all comes into play. I will admit changing my mindset wasn't easy at the beginning, but it's all part of it, and I'm thankful and blessed that I have not had to use correct sentence structure yet. It is better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Happy learning. 100% correct. I'm in 100% agreement with that. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Next comment comes from All Mike One, and they say, "How to get involved if I want to take part in the workshops?" As you know, folks, if you've watched these comments videos in the past, and I've done quite a few of them, you know that I'll get an individual like this every once in a while, folks. In every just about ninety-nine point nine percent of every video I create. My email address is plastered across the bottom of the screen. If you watch the video in its entirety, I tell you at the very end exactly how to apply for a workshop. In the description of the video, there is information on how to contact me. It's all there. All Mike, I have to guess, didn't watch the video or didn't pay attention because he's asking me how to get involved if I want to take part in the workshops. So with the balance of the honor and the grace, I said, email me. Please include your full correct name. As of yet, all Mike one has not reached out. Big surprise. Next comment comes from member and longtime viewer, Rosvon. And they say, I see your point. Nobody likes a show off. Being correct and being right, as you put it, are to me two different things. Correctness and grace go hand in hand because it's logical to be tolerant. It gives the opportunity to teach far better than doing nothing. And tolerance is a big part of being humble, isn't it? How correct is correctness to each one individually? And being right is about the ego. Use half-baked science to show and boast. Now, I have to disagree with this. I know that Rosvon's first language is not English. So we can use some grace in this 
uh, context. They're saying being correct and being right are two different things. That that yes, I mean in correct sentence structure, of course, because one and one is in, one and one is one. But in the fiction, which is what we're using right now, because Rosvon has not used brackets, so they are using a fictitious conveyance of grammar, and I must do the best I can to glean value from it in the context of this lesson. He says, it's logical to be tolerant. Now, what does tolerant mean? If you look at it in a, uh, look it up in a fiction dictionary, which, I mean, what other dictionary do you have at your disposal? Tolerant means that you put up with something that you normally wouldn't. So to me, tolerance means that you're putting up with something that you normally wouldn't put up with. You're, you're basically suffering for a reason. I don't agree with that. I don't agree that it's logical to be tolerant. Okay? I disagree with that logic. Um, tolerance is a big part of being humble. I don't agree with that either. If you're being humble, that doesn't mean that you can be a doormat and get walked on. That's not what that means at all. Being humble means that you know that you can make mistakes. It doesn't mean turn the other cheek. That's completely a misconception there. If, if you think that, Rosvon, that's a complete misconception as far as I'm concerned. In your world, in your biosphere, that may be what it means, but it doesn't mean anything close to that in mine. Humility doesn't mean you can get taken advantage of. Although it's very easy to make that mistake. Uh, but really, it's not. Because, I mean, too much honor is hell. Too much humility is also hell. You got to find a balance there. Being right is about the ego. Well, in the context that I said, if you're going to choose being right and being correct over humility, then yeah, it's completely about ego, 100%. Folks that choose correctness in that poll over humility, they don't have closure on the grammar. And I know Rosvon, even though he's been a longtime student, I know that he still has not reached closure on the grammar. So I wish you, I wish you well, Rosvon, on your journey. And... Um, Wish only blessings for you and your family. Next comment comes from SPKN Paradise, and they say, this question pertains to tangible contract and non-tangible contract words. If I have the sentence, she cleaves to her husband, would cleaves be non-tangible contract, despite the fact that one could assume the word means adhere to? Because of the word to in the sentence, Cleave can mean both adhering to or splitting from. Thank you. Shantavia Trot. Well, again, this comes from an individual who does not have closure on the grammar. And it appears is nowhere near getting closure on the grammar. So with the balance of the honor and the grace, let me offer a little help. If I have the sentence, she cleaves to her husband, would cleaves be non-tangible? No, it would not. Because as I've said over and over and over again, ad nauseum in my Parse playlist, the rule for credentialing tangibility and non-tangibility is to look the word up in an etymology dictionary. It does not matter what you think or feel or what your interpretation of it is in this context. What matters is, is actually looking it up in an outside source and seeing what the earliest nativity root meaning of the word is, and if that meaning is tangible, then you would syntax it as tangible. That way, it's not subjective, it's objective. That way, your syntax is gonna be the same as my syntax, and it's gonna be consistent across the board. This is what I've been teaching for six years. 900 videos on this channel, Sean Tavia. It's all there for you. You just have to take the time to study. I'm pretty sure you're new at this, um, but the fastest way to learn is through workshops. If you get value from what I do, then, and you're serious about this, then that would be the route to go. 
It's very hard to learn this in a comments field on YouTube. Anyways, I hope that helps. I've just given you closure on how to credential tangibility and non-tangibility in words. It has nothing to do in this context with your feelings or impressions of something. It has everything to do with an etymology dictionary. Another one from SPKN, and they say, I just wanted to wish all the fathers a happy Father's Day and practice using correct sentence structure. And they say, for this author's hyphen volition of this statement and claim is with the communication of the joy with the fathers of the world with the honor by this author and asteric Shantavia hyphen Monique colon space trot asteric. So let's look at the sentence. Now, I'm not going to make a big deal of, about the non-capitalization of certain words because this individual may not use capitalization in their sentences, which is fine as long as they give closure to that in the document dictionary, in the concordance. So the cause of the sentence is the author's volition. What's the author's volition concerned with? The statement and claim. Singular verb is. What is possessing the statement and claim? The communication. What is the communication concerned with? The joy. So the communicating joy. What is possessing the joy? The fathers. What are the fathers, fathers concerned with? The world. What's possessing the world? The honor. Who is the authority of the honor? The author, Shantavia. So it appears as though, when you read this sentence forwards, Shantavia is making a claim for fathers, saying that they're joyful. They're communicating. Okay, the communication, with the communication, is possessing the statement and claim. It's concerned with the joy being possessed by the fathers. So she's saying that the fathers are possessing joy, and in correct sentence structure, we do not make claims for others. We just don't. Although she has not said that this is a claim. Oh, wait. Yes, she did. And yes, she does say this is a claim. But we don't know who the claimant is because she does not credential a claimant. She just credentials an author. So let's read it backwards. For this author of the honor is with the world. So the world is possessing the honor. Now she's making a claim for the world. What is the world concerned with? Of the fathers. What's possessing the fathers? The joy. Again, now she's making a claim for the fathers and the world. Of the communication with the statement claim by this author's volition. This is a great uh, maybe first effort. They've definitely learned a lot without a tutor. But I also will definitely say they need a tutor if they're serious about this grammar. They will do what it takes to learn it. I will also say they got a good base and a good start. But their conveyance is very muddy and it's unclear. Again, we don't know who the claimant is. Now I will address the bottom part where we have the hysterics. Why do we have hysterics there? And we do not end on an authority. We, un we end on a concern by this author, Shantavia Heifel Monique of the trot. So that throws the whole thing into adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun. So let's see what else she says here. She says, for the bottom line, and she puts the asterisks in there, of the compound facts is with the oity of the bold text with the bottom line void by this system, YouTube. Now she's making a claim for YouTube. That's interesting. We, again, we do not make claim for, uh, claims for others. For this system of the bottom line void, so for the system of no bottom line, no underline, is with the bold text of the oite, with the compound facts by the bottom line. So the bottom line is using the compound facts. I, that completely makes zero sense to me. 
Since YouTube does not allow the use of an underline, I am using the bold font. This sentence does not convey that at all. To me, it doesn't. This other one up here is the better sentence. Everything is still a work in progress, but thanks for the opportunity to practice. Have a great day. Okay, so I didn't print my response. So my kuleana to that is, what is an hysteric? Why are you using an hysteric? As far as I'm concerned, I've never used an hysteric in correct sentence structure. I don't use it. There's an, it's not necessary. So I asked her, what is your closure on it? What's your finite mean for the hysteric? And she didn't answer. Not to mention the fact that hysteric is a vowel in front of a consonant means no contract. So, again, she's a beginner, so with the balance of the honor and the grace, maybe she will get serious and take a workshop. Who knows? Thanks for the comment. Next comment comes from quadruple A again, and they say, now that's clever. And my kuleana to that is, now is a pronoun. And nothing can follow a pronoun except for a break in the continuance of the evidence or an adverb. So that's is a non-tangible contract adverb. And clever is a dangling participle verb. Oh, and by the way, now is also a non-tangible contract. So as you know, or maybe you don't know, pronouns can be either tangible or non-tangible. Adverbs can only be non-tangible. And verbs can either be tangible or non-tangible. So again, it's interesting that an individual such as quadruple A that has been here for a year or more doesn't put their <laughs> adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, fiction, babble in brackets. So they choose to participate with a fictitious conveyance of grammar, which, I mean, that's perfectly fine if that's what they want to do. But if you're going to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, there are ways to navigate with the fiction system alongside it without participating with it. And as someone once said, if you perform in the small things the same way you perform in the large things, and you create a rule one, rule equal, geometric level playing field of contract communication, there's less room for error and less room for making mistakes and getting into trouble. But if you're just going to throw something out there like, now that's clever, then that speaks to where you are at, perhaps, psychologically, with this grammar. Perhaps you are not ready to focus on your grammar with laser-like precision. But myself, I'm thinking that there are a few of you out there that are ready to do this, that are ready to get serious about it that are ready to learn the mechanics and use them on a daily basis so that you cultivate your humility and cultivate your correctness. And instead of yelling from the top of a mountain that you're correct and blah, 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 you just perform and do very basic little general humble performances in the public on the internet and things like that and people will see what you're doing and the ones that uh, vibrate on that same frequency, so to speak, will be drawn to you. And that's how we start a community of good people. Good people, correct people, humble people, folks that I want to contract with, folks that are humble. They want to be humble. They want to cultivate humility rather than being right all the time, being correct and being a hard ass and being a bully. <laughs> I've had enough of that. I, I, most of my life has been involved in stuff like that. I, I'm going to take a different path now, folks. I'm cultivating a different path. I'm attracting different folks into my biosphere, and I'm pretty happy with it, especially with the students that have gotten closure on the grammar from me, my best students. They're all stellar human beings with the cultivation of the humility and creativeness and all that stuff. It's wonderful. And if you want to be a part of that, the first step is to take the workshops and learn the grammar. And you can stay tuned for more data on that. Thanks for watching.
Thank <laughs> you.